transplantation in the case of multiple myeloma and also in the case of lymphoma. And the first speaker is our guest from Poland, Professor Jerzy Holowiecki, and topic is myeloma and the role of autologous stem cell transplantation. Please, Professor, floor is yours. Well, I, I need my slides. So, uh, at first, I would like to say good afternoon, and I would like to express my cordial thanks to the organizers for the kind invitation to this meeting. The same to Professor Nidir Wieser, who is a good guest of this conference. Uh, so I never been in, in Kaunas, but I got some contact because one of my best friends was sitting in my school times close to me. He was born here and this um, was an occasion to visit his house and to learn a little bit about your food and customs. So I am very happy to be this time here. So the subject is uh, very rich of publication and it's not so easy to pick up uh, the most important one. I will start with statements that Myeloma is a clonal disease which is presenting in full performance with CRAP uh, syndrome. The incidence is about 4.5 to 6 per 100,000 and it is important that uh, the majority of patients are over 70 so we have always to think about this uh, uh, age range. Uh, according to word classification, so we can have patients with different phases of this disease and we should be very careful when uh, making a decision of giving second line treatment, for example, because we have to know where are we, whether here or we came from here to here or, or so. Uh, patients with smoldering myeloma, uh, practically always proceed to the full power disease. And uh, in first five years, 50% of patients go to this phase. Then after the curve is not as steel and uh, it's about 2% per each year. The basic question is whether we made some progress. So I would say, until the beginning of this millennium, it was not the case, but I think afterwards we see some progress in terms of survival. So the question arises, what's the role of autologous transplantation is in this uh, progress and whether conventional chemotherapy is still inferior? So I put together some results of randomized trials, which, as you see, majority, majority, vast majority speak yes. High dose treatment with autologous transplant is better. But these studies were published uh, uh, at the beginning of this millennium. So thanks to the God, there is one which was cited today. It's the study by Palumbo, which again shows a great advantage of high-dose treatment supported by autologous transplantation. So taking all together, we can see six out of eight randomized trials speak for autologous transplantation. And this is important that the transplant-related mortality seems to be very long, so in the experience center it's not over 1%. Uh, I think it's also important to mention uh, this was one uh, study uh, coming from uh, Sweden, I think, which proved that there is um, economic base, so it, the cost of one year, year of life is very low. Uh, one message, ex vivo purging doesn't work because this wasn't mentioned today, so I, I, I just mentioned it now. So, 
because of these results, nowadays in Europe, one half of all autologous transplant is being performed in myeloma, one half of all. I take this opportunity to uh, answer the question how it looks like in Poland. So we started with transplant program at the beginning of 90s, I would say. Here were only single transplants. Now, last year we did uh, 1,500, over 1,500 of different kinds of transplantation. And again, going to autologous, close to 1,000 transplant in 2015, 50% in myeloma. So it's corresponding perfectly to the European uh, value. I am now in this center. I moved here in 2008 before I did about 1,700 transplant in another center in Katowice. In that time, we get in touch with some Lithuanian uh, hematologist. Uh, and I will speak now about this new center where I am uh, about six years now. So we started the program here. Uh, last year we did 270 transplant in this new unit. So you can see which kinds of. And again, if we look at the percentage of myeloma patient in autologous setting, this figure is for five years in this new center. The, uh, we transplanted 1,200 patients in these five years. So again, here, more than one half was in general with myeloma. But if we look at the last year, it's only 36. Why? Because we switch more to allogeneic transplantation. It's now 12% of all myeloma. So I think it, this is the direction probably for the coming future. So, uh, what is the problem? The problem is that this strategy doesn't produce cure. So, 90% of patients relapse. So, what are the solutions? So, we have to improve all the depths of complete remission, new agents and combinations, improvement of technology, tandem maintenance after, and tandem auto allo, which will be uh, then presented by Professor Garton. Uh, the algorithm of technology, which we do is at first to make a clinical work up, and if we find the active disease, we give induction. If it's successful, in, I mean, if brings the patient to complete or at least partial remission, people harvest stem cells. And if successful, which is nowadays in 98%, we give high dose conditioning and we give single or double transplant. A discussion is still uh, where and of have we to do it or not. The same for maintenance, which should be given, I think, based on personalized um, analysis. If there is a relapse, we give sulfage one, and then we can repeat autologous transplant or switch to allogeneic. And then the capo alfine, as long as the patient is capable to survive these procedures. Induction. Induction is extremely important and we should balance the strength of conditioning because the target is here to have the deepest possible complete remission. But on the other side, we have r risk and we have to look not to disturb the mobilization capacity of these patients. Probably you remember that lenalidomide was found to uh, deteriorate this. But there are many uh, questions which were raised today in, 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 in the former lectures. 
It's a question, does obtaining of complete remission matters? Or we can, as some people do, refer patients with impartial remission to the transplant center. So I, I just will show the review. It is review of prospective and retrospective studies and uh, 10 prospective, 11 retrospective, two meta-analyses. Clear answer, yes, yes. The quality of remission induction is important. Uh, whether new drugs play a role. There was a perfect lecture, so I will just move quickly over some problems. Here you see the uh, drugs well established and this in red as, which are new and newly uh, accepted by FDA. And there is a series of studies proving that this new combination are better if compared to the oldest. Uh, here are some details. This was presented uh, one hour ago, so I will not go to details. This slide shows that if we have a good remission before autologous transplantation, we can add, uh, but we could add more with VAD. And now, in total, we have uh, better results. It means induction is very important, but uh, this space for improvement is growing smaller. One point. All these studies I just did show target on very good partial remission. It means we are looking uh, at patients, measuring the success with 10 or 9 fold reduction of the tumor. But there is still a lot of tumor in these patients. So uh, at first we can say that there is a cooperation cooperation with new drug, okay, it's okay. But probably it's not correct to look only on very good partial remission. And again, an important paper from the French group targeted on very good partial remission and also make a statement. This is an important target, but there appeared a very interesting paper by Kapoor which shows that it's not true. If we look on patient in complete remission or stringent complete remission, they do much better if compared to very good partial remission. If we put it all together, we will get this difference. If we will bring patient to complete remission, so we'll get better. This is the answer to the perfect lecture we heard here, what to do to improve the results. So high quality sustained remission should be a target and not uh, VGPR. And if so, I, I present just an overview of studies where the complete remission is given uh, so, for example, this one with cartizomib combined with uh, lenalidomide and dexamethasone, and some quite new studies in earlier phases, uh, different combination of RVD plus some drugs. This was uh, analyzed one hour ago, so I will drop this um, problem. And the next question is, whether minimal residual disease, which is something more than complete remission, uh, is important. So I will start with showing the, com the method which are available. First one is flow cytometry, which is uh, available practically in majority of centers. Then next generation sequencing, molecular tool, which is for sure for studies, not so far for everyday practice. And finally, PET scanning for patients with extramedullary myeloma. 
And now, to make the story short, a very important study is here, uh, Ralph Strom. If you look at patients who are in remission, uh, it means uh, with flow cytometry, we can say they uh, are in emission. They always do better compared to those in non-remission. And this is true both for patients with good cytogenetic as for patients with bad cytogenetic. So there is, in general, not as good result, but in both this cohort, stratified according to cytogenetic, minimal residual negative patients are doing better. So, so let's speculate how it's like that. Again, come, we are coming to the question which was presented here. So after induction, we are getting patients to different stages of remission according to different agreements. And after autologous transplantation, we go even to a better uh, level of, of um, remission. And then dependently upon the depth of the remission, we have a statistical chance for relapse in shorter or in longer time. So that's why it's important to bring patient here, somewhere here, not leave it him, because this time to relapse will be longer or shorter. But, there is one but, this might not be true for a patient who is even in good stringent remission, but he has different disease based on different cytogenetics. So even in good stringent remission, he can relapse. So it's a, a message we need also some risk stratification from the very beginning. If the tumor load is so important for time to relapse, so the concept of double transplant or tandem transplant is justified, it's clear. Let's uh, uh, answer the question. The idea was raised by Bartel Barlogi and I think the crucial study was this one, French one, it was also mentioned today, which proved that it looks to be fine. Uh, these are the curves, double transplant doing better uh, for disease-free survival and overall survival. And then after there was a series of prospective studies coming from European countries mainly. And again, to make this story short, I will say three out of these listed here speak for doing double transplant. But the benefit was evident mainly in patients who after first transplant were in VGPR or stable the disease. So maybe this is a landmark where to do it. But to the, all these studies, I found recently a Cochrane meta-analysis which is extremely <laughs> critical. So practically the, uh, the conclusion is that in present state of knowledge, only patient with partial remission or stable disease should be that's treated with tandem transplant outside clinical trials. So using clinical trials we can do it, but regularly only in this situation. And currently there is one important trial in the United States comparing double MEL200 and lenalidomide um, post-transplant maintaining with uh, consolidation instead of second transplant or just uh, instead of doing maintenance. 
Uh, and good news is it's, it's the results are expected very soon, in October. So maybe the situation will be clear. Uh, now, some questions con concerning improvement of technology. Uh, so the target number of cells for collection, we, we discussed this point several times today, uh, is like this here. And normally people use this uh, technology, uh, cyclophosphamide followed by GCSF. But some years ago we got an information that RSC is also uh, active. So this motivated us to make a study. This is a type, it was published in bone marrow transplantation, the first one. What we found is 45 patients, 70 patients, that in this RSC arm, we collected close to three times more cells. And 90% of the situation, one run was sufficient in, in myeloma setting, sufficient for double transplant. Uh, here uh, is the analysis. We repeated this study also in multi-center study in Poland, and this was again recently published, so it really works. Second improvement in technology in our unit in Gliwice concerned the cryo preservation um, um, process. I had about one year time to organize the center. In that time, we uh, made trials which, with lower concentration of DMSO instead of 10, because with 10, both patient is suffering of smell and vomiting, and we know that in room temperature, DMSO is killing stem cells. So it's better to go down here. And recently we work with 5%, I will tell you. But what I am going to show now uh, is a series of studies which we published um, proving that 7.5 is sure. It works in clinical um, situation and it doesn't uh, it doesn't destroy the clonal potential of CD34 positive cells. So it was uh, proven uh, in vitro. Next issue is conditioning before autologous transplantation. And uh, this French study, which was also mentioned here today, uh, produce this standard, MEL 200. In the meantime, there were many trials to improve it, manipulating with the dose of MEL in both directions, uh, using completely different uh, compositions. But the majority uh, tried to improve the conditioning based on this MEL backbone. And some are really pr promising, even this Bumel, which didn't show promising at the beginning, but long-term results look to be good, fine. All uh, recent Melphalan Bendamastin, for example. But there is one common point. No one is using irradiation. And irradiation is very uh, active in myeloma. So we went back to this crucial study published 14 years ago by a French group, which show, did show that MEL is superior to MEL 140 combined with 8 gray TBI. At first I would like to say that there are some objections concerning uh, con, uh, uh, addressed to the supportive care, which was worse in the uh, in in the uh, TBI group. But 
The second point is that it was 12 years ago. In that time, irradiation made tremendous progress. And I work in a unit where we have 12 accelerators. We have tomographic irradiation and cyber knife, what, all possible. So our colleagues welcome us cordially when we told, let's try to make marrow irradiation, total marrow, marrow irradiation. We are doing also skin irradiation for mycosis fungoides from the wool country and so and so. And we did a prospective study which was registered and in this study, patients obtained tandem transplant, one with TMI, total myro hydration, three fractions, each four gray, so it's full power, and then second transplant with male. So this gave good opportunity to compare the toxicity. And this is just to show the idea, so, uh, the irradiation is carefully planned to irradiate only skeleton, not to touch the soft tissue. If there is a PET sign, all are submitted to PET, if they are PET positive, they get, in addition, a boost on these places. Uh, this is a patient before he goes to this tomographic irradiation. And here is an overview of the study. 49 were included uh, of 53 and had characteristics of all patients. Uh, 88 got sufficient number of cells with this RAC approach. And these are in brief the results. So before first transplant, after first, and after second. As you see, the proportion of patients in string and complete remission and in complete remission is growing higher on cost of partial and very good partial remission. So the efficacy looks not to be too bad. This shows the reduction of uh, uh, clonal protein load. And this shows that all patients survived, no one died, so after two transplants, it looks to be safe. Progression free survival, 71% at two years. I calculated it again yesterday, so it looks that about 89% are still alive. Uh, and, um, the regeneration perfect, and TMI toxicity, look, mucositis, 2% only, for example. And if you look at uh, high dose male, it's, as far as I remember, 16%. So this technology is producing very little side effects because the wool power of irradiation is directed to skeleton. So this is our conclusion showing this, uh, this is phase two study. So feasibility and side effects. So based on that, we can say it is feasible. It doesn't produce harm to the patient. And uh, I, I told I will not um, say anything about allogeneic transplant, but please excuse me for this one slide. Recently, uh, we are using also TMI before allogeneic transplant in myeloma, and we combine this with bendamastin. Uh, at first, we ran a pilot studies, and as you see, the tolerance was fine. And now, quickly, maintenance. It was discussed today, so I will just show the drugs which are candidates in everyday life. And theoretically, we have much more. And Ludwig gave a perfect meta-analysis showing that thalidomide is active in terms of progression-free survival and overall survival. One warning is that thalidomide maintenance looks to 
be danger for patients in high risk, a paper by Morgan. And another um, comparison of studies, French and CLGB, lenalidomide superior compared to placebo, and another one, Hovon study showing that this technology uh, with Bortem Zomib maintenance works fine, a paper, and now ongoing trials with some new drugs. The last issue is relapse, it was uh, today discussed as well, so I will just warn that at first we have to analyze whether this is really a relapse or only laboratory relapse, so, and then look at the time between transplantation and relapse. If it's below six months, it's bad. You have to look for second line treatment and allogeneic problem. If it's later, so you can uh, consider the first uh, remission induction treatment. These are candidates uh, listed by NCCN and approved with category one is this yellow. And again, uh, a good uh, paper showing uh, the advantage of pamil uh, might uh, treatment. Another one, uh, bartizomib. Uh, here is uh, the result. And there are many other trials running now with new drugs. Uh, I finished practically, but just a short message. Don't forget about bifosphonates. Uh, some uh, studies show that solendronic is better, but I will show but. But please remember, all patients should obtain bifosphonate irrespective of the presence of bone lesions. Because we see only strong bone lesions and for the second, this treatment has probably also some antiplasmocytoma activity. But when using zolendronic acid, please be careful with jaw syndrome, especially with zolendronic acid. How to do it? I will skip this. So this is the last message. The role of first line autologous is confirmed. Achievement of high quality remission before this procedure is important. Not so rigidly particular treatment, for example, three times this or this, but achievement of deep complete remission is important. So, I mean, personalized approach. Maintenance, promising. Indica indication for transplantation should be based on integrated risk profiles, looking at all measures we have now. But the results are still unsatisfactory, especially in poor risk patients, and we have to think about improvements. And in fit patients, we should always offer and perform, if possible, allogeneic transplant. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions from the audience, please? Please, Professor. Well, I think what you showed about total married radiation is interesting. And my question is, uh, because you have relatively little side effects, could there be another upper limit for using total uh, married radiation, thinking about that you want to obtain a stringent complete remission? A molecular emission. Yes, of course, it's, it's a very important question. I, I did show only these patients who were included to this prospective registered trial, but we made, I don't know how many, uh, we, we did 512 transplants in this unit only for myeloma, so 
and majority was made using total marrow, marrow irradiation. So it's our regular it's procedure. Well, this would be the next step, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. We have to discuss it with uh, colleagues. Okay, thank you. More questions? I'd like to ask you two questions. Um, I've learned from the talk that you are using RAC, in the media dose RAC, RAC for, uh, for mobilization regimen. Can you tell us something about the kinetics on which day you perform the stem cells? And we, we have a lot of complications. I will say frankly, my younger colleagues told me, uh, we heard that it works in single patients. Uh, I thought it is completely stupid. RAC is for, for acute leukemia, not for myeloma. But we tried it, that it, it is functioning. So. We just uh, think that maybe it's acting on uh, CX4, uh, yeah. um, you know, uh, th this PD um, uh, receptor ligand. Mm -hmm. uh, and we already planned a study in Stettin with a cooperating group of one colleague who is very far advance in this uh, point, but now we have such a lot of patients that we don't have time for science, so uh, it wasn't made, but probably it's an important point if uh, when you want to convince somebody to this technique. And how about the complications, the medical complications in the patients who are receiving RAC? With RAC? Yeah, yeah. Do you have more s fibrile neutropenias oh, well, or something? Well, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, some Patients after RAC produce um, uh, skin reaction mm. or fever, and we know it perfectly as uh, as con <laughs> very uh, very experienced um, uh, leukemia team. So over years we did see it in acute leukemia patients and. Um, it seems to me that those patients respond much better to the treatment. I am speaking about leukemia patients who show this skin reaction. But here, I don't remember any other complications. So how long is the aplasia time in these RAC treated patients? How long is the aplasia? <coughs> oh, well. Uh, I, I would say it doesn't play any role because we are doing it as a regular technique and patients are com coming in planned uh, day and I don't remember that anyone stayed longer because of complication. No, the question is, it's longer than with cyclophosphamide, the mobilization uh, with RSC? No, no, no. So, we plan two weeks for this, if they are on hospital basis. Because it's in Poland at least more easy to admit the patient for two weeks than to organize, uh, you know, half, half. Uh, earlier we did it so that they will given RAC outside and they came just for mobilization. But now we are getting patients from very far, from Szczecin is 700 kilometer, Olsztyn five, six hundred kilometers, so, so it's better if they come and stay. So two weeks up to 70 days. I, uh, you showed very nicely about the second transplant and if they are in stable disease and in, I think it was in partial remission, correct? Or what was the, your point? Well, I ca cannot answer exactly this question because uh, well, we need to, to make a study. Yeah. Many of these patients are from <laughs> other centers, and again, to answer, we should admit them to, uh, to make accurate analysis. I base on, uh, we, uh, they are coming to me, and we do um, exact um, monoclonal protein, and we do uh, flow cytometry uh, when, where we expect stringent uh, remission and, and so. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor. 
I'm looking forward to announce the talk of uh, Professor Gosta Garten from Stockholm. 